Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Well, we've started recording on my end, yeah. guys. That's so we can, yeah, oh, so we can... Maybe I can... Uh, wait, there's a chance I could stop that, right? Yeah. Pause recording. Push that. Oh, it will do that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you want me to start it? The opinions and suggestions expressed on the following program are solely those of the participants and not necessarily endorsed by program sponsors or any radio station, media company, or platform broadcasting this program. The following program is a product of Causeway LLC. The information in this broadcast is not intended as investment, tax, or financial advice. Matthew Moore is not a licensed investment advisor and speaks solely from his experience and opinions. All information in this broadcast is for entertainment or educational purposes only. Matthew Moore, Causeway LLC, and the company or platform broadcasting this program is not responsible for the success or failure of any person's investment decisions or purchases. Matthew Moore, Causeway LLC, and the company or platform broadcasting this program makes no and expressly disclaims all representations, warranties, and guarantees with respect to this broadcast and its sponsors. Investing in any market is inherently risky and can be financially dangerous. Invest at your own risk. Government officials in Welcome to Cryptocurrency with Matthew J. Moore, the Bitcoin-focused radio show that's waking the masses to the fiat money Ponzi scheme. Money is changing, and your freedom is at stake. So stick around and learn how to empower yourself for this new digital age. Now, here's your host, Matthew J. Moore. And uh, welcome, America, and welcome, world. That's right. No matter where you are or what you're listening on, I want to welcome all of you Bitcoin lovers, newbies, and experts, because truth is we have a little bit of something for everybody. So uh, it doesn't matter what city you're listening in on uh, or if you're listening online. Uh, we've got a great show today. And as always, to help me navigate this wonderful world of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is my co-host, RJ, also known as Rick Jackson. Rick, how are you doing in Oklahoma City today? I'm doing great. I'm ready to dive in. Love it. Well, um, let's uh, let's before we do, before we dive into the show, let's talk about uh, some things that are coming up because uh, both you and I, um, we are actually going to be in Nashville this month in uh, what about a week or two or so. And two weeks. Uh, uh, yeah, and and pretty much anybody and everybody who is in the Bitcoin space will be in Nashville. In fact, uh, we will be there for two specific reasons. Uh, one is the Litecoin Summit. Uh, talking about uh, government regulation, the developments that are happening in the policy world. And uh, I'm going to be moderating the panel. And uh, RJ, you're going to be on that panel. And uh, That's right. there's, there's going to be a, a handful of other people, including uh, Dennis Porter. We're super excited about it. And if you guys who are listening to the show want to join us in Nashville and be at that uh, conversation live, you can go to litecoin.net forward slash summit and use our promo code LTC20. For Matt, that's LTC twenty four Matt, and uh, it's going to be at the Margaritaville Hotel in Nashville. That's uh, July twenty fourth and twenty fifth, and then we have the Big Kahuna, uh, the 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 biggest Bitcoin conference in the world taking place that week, uh, just across the street, and it's going to be July twenty fifth uh, through the twenty seventh. And uh, if you are hey going to go to that too, might as well use our promo code. BTC radio for 10% off of your tickets. You can also go to my website, mattjmore.com for, uh, you know, finding that, uh, that promo code mattjmore.com. You'll see a little tab there that says uh, BTC 24. I would love to see everybody there because uh, I have a blast every single time I go, I meet people, I learn things and uh, eh, maybe I party a little too much, but it's uh, it's all, it's all good uh, fun and games and, uh, and education, but RJ, let's get this show on the road. Uh, who do we have with us today and what are we talking about? Yeah. Today's going to be a little bit of a different format for us rather than kind of that interview style where we, we kind of do like a narrative and try to teach people today is going to be a little bit more of a friendly banter style where I will take one side of a, a discussion and our guest will take the other. And we're going to talk about some things related to the big market cycles around Bitcoin. What what really uh, is the thing that drives price in Bitcoin? What drives the narrative? What drives developments? Is it external factors? Is it internal factors? Is it the grand fractal of the universe expressing itself through the medium of technology? We're going to get all into that. Our guest today, 
Adam Meister, a 2013 Bitcoin OG. He's been in the space since basically it started. I mean, unless you were on the crypto, quite literally cryptography list serves and were there at the launch of 2009, 2010. If, if you know how Finney, God rest his soul, personally, there's there's nobody who's earlier. And so that's who's talking. I, I as a 2016 entrance, of a, am a relative newbie to this guy. So our, our guest, Adam Meister. Adam, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on, guys. I'm pumped to be here. Adam knows a thing or two. In fact, uh, your your uh, famous intro, what is it? Uh, Adam Meister, the Bitcoin Meister? Hey, you still, you still running with that? everyone. <laughs> this is Adam Meister, Bitcoin Meister, this Rup Meister. Pound that like button, everybody. Pound it. That's right, right. Comment, subscribe, and like. Be a part of the conversation. Uh, Adam, you know, it's so good to have you back on the show. Last time uh, you were on, we were doing a live uh, recording in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma on KRMG. Uh, now our show's been in Chicago and Oklahoma City. We've been in some other cities as well. But um, I felt like bringing you on uh, would be great because uh, – like we we're saying, you've you've seen a couple cycles, and there's uh yeah, there's some new people in the space. There's been people who've uh, come you know gone through a couple cycles. I myself, uh, 2017 uh, was my entry, but um, there's a lot of theories that take place uh, when it comes to what causes uh, that, uh, that 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 number go up, right? And then sometimes number go down. Uh, but <laughs> it's very cyclical. Uh, but before we dive into that, please, I want our audience to get a, a an idea. Uh, of who you are, uh, why you've been in the space so long, and um, I don't know. We'll, we'll dive into what you've seen, but just give everybody a little bit of background on who you are. Well, yeah, uh, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. Originally, I was always into tech. Uh, I was uh, always a little interested in finance. I got into alternative finance. I found out about Bitcoin in about 2011, and uh, I decided when uh, Coinbase uh, finally opened in 2013 to get my first two Bitcoin. And I just I became kind of just I loved it from the very start. I love the a aspect of uh, of a mo uh, stateless money. That was the first thing that I liked about it. But the, the te technological thing uh, got got to me. And obviously, uh, no, no inflation. Uh, you know, they all, you couldn't print as much as you wanted. And you know, I started learning more and more about economics as I learned more and more about uh, Bitcoin also. And it just uh, got me into the more of a freedom mindset also. And it's just been an amazing journey, just traveling all around the world, talking about it, learning about it. And just, uh, yeah, I I just thought the simplest thing to do was just have a strong hand. And uh, that that's my technique. Uh, I know it sounds boring to a lot of people, but I just buy and hold. That's really all I've been saying since the beginning. And uh, if you've done that, you've done very well <laughs> since the beginning. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, it's been fun. Yeah, strong hands, diamond hands for sure. Um, and uh, I, I, uh, I want to start it here because you know, twenty twenty four, obviously, very interesting year. Uh, when it comes to campaigns, policy. Uh, when it comes to Wall Street, you know, spot Bitcoin ETFs, yada, yada, yada. Uh, we've made new all-time highs uh, in dollar price uh, back in March around, you know, yeah. just a, around that $74,000 uh, price point, you know, when that whole spot Bitcoin ETF news was making a, a ruckus. Uh, and then in April, we've seen the uh, Bitcoin happening with uh, the block re rewards to the miners uh, literally being cut in half from 6.25 Bitcoins to 3 Point one two five bitcoins, um, supply and demand economics. I think a lot of people say play a huge part in the cyclical nature of Bitcoin and the and the price action, uh, and you know there's there's noticeable patterns and uh, different narratives. But let's let's start here, Adam. Um, what is your hot take? I mean, are this bull market that that we're supposedly in? Are we on time? Are we late? Is it uh, early? Have we already, I mean, some people are even like, oh, the bull market's over. We're not going to have a bull market. You know, like there's all these different <laughs> narratives out here. What is your hot take? Well, you know, I've been around this so many times. It's my third presidential election during this. And every presidential election, they say the world's about to end too because, you know, Trump's going to become president. And, uh, and you know, the, and, and this time it's different. And so the Bitcoin cycle is different. And thus we already reached the high. There's not going to be a high this time. And, and yet every time it's the exact same thing. It's the exact, the 2023 was just like 2019, which was uh, just like uh, 2015. 
I mean, they're there wherever you would you, know, you, you get the I might have messed up the numbers there, but every four years it's basically the same thing. OK, so in this part of the cycle, we're after the halving. This is where we should be. It should be returning to its previous all time high of sixty nine thousand. <laughs> but the thing that got messed messed up this time is we reached we got back to sixty nine before the halving because of the Bitcoin ETF. That was different this time. So what? So we were a little early this time. We got, so people are spoiled this time. We got, instead of getting to the, returning to the all-time high in November or December of this year, we got it in March. And so people don't know what to do. People are, they're like, well, it's, it's clearly dead. No. So so people are scared that we're around 58,000 now. It's exactly where we should be on the road to six, back to 69,000. So it's all built around the habit. Okay, around supply and demand, but it's become psychological now too. I mean, people are used to. It. I mean, the miners do the exact same thing. They, uh, you know, they, 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 they try to hold on as long as possible. Then they have to sell. Um, you have macro things that scare certain people away during the off years. Every time, you know, in 2022 we had uh, Sam Bankman and everything. But then 2018 we had stuff. 2014 we had stuff. I mean, and but every time people think it's it's worse this time. It's and you know, some of these calamities are on a larger scale, but it's just, it's basically the same thing every four years. And so I, I you know, I hear people say, well, this time it's different. I'm, I'm selling at a uh, 65,000. I'm like, dude, uh, wow. it, I would not do that because we, it, it's, it, it, you know, 2020 and you know, 2025 should be better than 2024 because 2021, it's always the year after the halving. That's the bet. That's the great year. That's the great year. So, 2021 was a blast. 2017 was a blast. 2013 was a blast. So 2025 will be a blast. So, I, I, no, I, I would not, it's, of all the times to sell, just hang on a little bit longer, dudes. It's just 2025 is, is less than six months away now, right? Yeah, it's July. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it's, it, the cycle is very strong here. These pat and people try to, you know, debunk it and say it's different this time. It had, you know, oh, look. If, this is a simple thing to remember too, and I, I think I say this every single time. You could pick any time in Bitcoin history and go back in time four years, and Bitcoin is worth more than it was four years ago at any moment. So uh, that's a it's a very important thing to remember. It's all based around that four year cycle. And so if you buy it today, guess what? As you know, as long as Bitcoin's been around, that the pattern's been in four years from today, it'll be worth more. So there you go. That's a simple a, a thing everyone can remember. Out there. Okay. Fair, fair take, fair take. Um, and I think a lot of people will agree with that. And, and so I'm going to kick it to you, RJ. What is your take on this? Because do you think we are on time early, mm. late, are things different? Um, what's your take on this? So, so I, I want to like caveat with, uh, these these are these are disagreements for the sake of discussion in the sense that everything for that a fun Adam conversation is, yeah everything that Adam is saying I, I more or less agree with almost entirely but that would not be fun if I just said yeah Adam's right that's great let's move on to the next thing so so I will I will take a a more even more first principled statement and say that what Adam is articulating is a function of other macro environmental factors and so I, I agree that the the happening has an impact, but I would say that really it is it is the system as a whole's ebbs and flows, the, the rising and, and waning of the tides in, in global money cycles that is actually what's driving these cycles. And, and I'll bring up a few things, right? Adam mentioned that every four years we go through this, and, and I would agree that that's, that would be the case. And that every year right after the happening is a little bit better than, the, than that year the happening occurs. If that were true, now I'm going to put on my my economist hat, and I were a game theory centric economist. If I know that every four years that this is going to happen, and every year after the happening, things are going to get better, a rational actor would say, "Well, let me let me start buying, or let me start my my activities like a month early." And if I know that, and Adam would know that, and Matt, you would know that, then we'd say, "Well, if, if everyone's going to do it a month early, I should do it two months early." Because I got to get in before right? the alpha is by moving before everybody else. And one month becomes two, becomes six months. And the next thing you know, really, it's the, the rational actor would just never stop buying, which is a good thing to do. I think Adam would agree that you know it's a good thing, just never stop. 
And so, and so where we get into these cycles is that I will, I will articulate the other side, which is not the other side, a different thing is that what's really driving these movements in price, not the slow, steady accumulation. That's a function of government money printing. That's a function of inflation. That's a function of the happening and all the other things that the reason that we get these big spikes and these big drops is that global liquidity cycles is looking for its new, uh, new target. And Bitcoin is the most responsive. It's the best answer. And so Take, taking the halvening cycle thing, right? If you look at the the November, we'll, we'll go 2012, 2016, 2020. Those are when that last, the halvenings occurred. The peak from the peak after, so the, the market high after the, 2020, the 2012 uh, uh, halvening, the market cycle high was up about a year later, 365 days, exactly as Adam has predicted, where he says, you know, the year after is is really when things go kind of parabolic. In 2016, 513 days, a little on the longer end, but still within that year after range. 2020 breaks that cycle. 2020, you have either, depending on how you want to look at it, 400 days, which either there's a double peak in 2021, or 190. Effectively, they were basically the same. So almost half of the time, nearly six months early, we hit that market cycle early. And so if you and I both know that this should be a year after, well, there's that rational that rational actor saying, well, if you know a year, I should do nine months. And someone else says, well, if they're doing nine months, I should do six. And we should be, ex- we should be constantly accelerating this new market high because everybody knows that they're moving off of that. Also, we know, uh, you know, as Adam mentioned, new all-time highs after the happening. That makes sense. We front ran that. The new the new all-time high came before happening. And so I, I think we have to, we one of two things. Either there's a fundamental kind of movement that's happening, and I'll articulate what I think it is, or or people are so smart that we're breaking the cycles, kind of the because we're we're pre we're front running it. And so I was I would say if we look at global liquidity, the 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 value of the dollar when money printing happens, if you overlay those two, and I'll go into it, but I, I want Adam to respond to kind of what I've articulated, is that if you if you look at it that way, we explain it pretty much just as well as anything else. So Adam, I, I put a lot on the table, uh, not to take over Matt's uh, kind of like moderator role, but I put a lot on the table. Go ahead, tear into it. T- tell me what you got. Yeah. I, well, before he does, I, I just just so you know, I need I want. Two parts. First, I want you to respond to what RJ said, whether you agree or disagree with it. Uh, second part, um, I've got a question for both of you regarding that. So go ahead, Adam. Wait, aren't we both right, though? I mean, aren't we sort of agreeing? You're just elaborating on, you know, giving some more reasons why why the Bitcoin prices, uh, we, we haven't reached the, uh, we're going to reach another all-time high soon. I mean, you're just, you're just add, add, adding complications and just adding on to my very basic theory. Yeah, so I, I would I would say I would say that I'm I'm going even further back. Is that what's driving? Basically, I'm saying the first step in what uh, I'm describing, or the first step in what you're describing, is what I'm describing. You're right in the sense that it's all kind of systematic. I, I would I'm going to say it's not the happening, or it's not something internal to Bitcoin itself. It's other factors that leverage Bitcoin that is is what's driving kind of the the price action. Yeah, I I'd, I'd say there, there's all sorts of things. I don't think. I, I mean, that's what I'm, I'm saying. I said it's psychological also. That's what I'm saying. Uh, it, it's it, There's all sorts of things that are pushing the, the, the narrative of every four years, this is the way it's going to be. And, and thus, every four years, it is that way. It's just you, you've added some more uh, depth to the entire thing. So I, I see nothing wrong with 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 anything that you said, except the, the, the one thing that I, I wanted to add Um you know, you, you talk about rational actors, you know, kind of uh, speeding up the pace of things. I mean, mm-hmm. perhaps I don't think the pace has been sped up that much. I mean, uh, you know, there's been also like questions at certain times of like, what really was the all time high? You know, but we couldn't even agree on 2013 when that really was or did it really count because Mount Gox inflated everything. I mean, there's so many little I mean, this is just I'm just concerned about general trends here. And that there are what you and I both agree on is that there what every time they're doomers and every time they're saying no 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 we're gonna there's not gonna be an all time there's not gonna be an all time high at all in, in uh, 2025 basically they say no 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 this we already reached the all time high it's gonna be a completely down mark you know something completely different like we're gonna go into a doom zone in 2025 type of thing you hear that every, and that's not what's we agree that 2025 is gonna be awesome don't we agree? That that'll be 2025. We will reach 
prices that are hot, higher than 2024. It, there will be a spike. You gave more in-depth reasons, more macro reasons why it, it's going to happen. And, and I, I, did, I just gave a, a simple form. Now, I do want to say again about rational actors and everything. One of the, the beautiful things about, uh, about Bitcoin is that we have so many irrational actors mm. here. So if you want to be a rational actor, you are going to win in the long run. But the, the irrational people add a lot of craziness and a lot of turbulence to this thing because, uh, I mean, let me tell you, they have the weakest hands. They panic at every little different thing that happens. And that's what's going on right now with the German thing and the, and the Mt. Gox thing. OK, I've been through this Mt. Gox is going to sell every every year we have. They're going to redistribute yeah. this year. They're going to sell this year. And guess it, it and people panic every time. But the long-term trend is it never destroys Bitcoin. Bitcoin always reaches an all-time high in 2025, 2021, you know, 2017 and, and, and 2013. It's it's always the same thing. But but we have these irrational people. They're like, oh, no, no, it's over this time. Time to buy Ethereum so, or, or whatever the latest thing is. Okay. So so that's what I, I would like to point out. A lot of people always like to talk about the rationality that's involved in the decision making that's here. You know, most of the people in this space are completely irrational complete it, it, they don't know the thing about any of the basics that we just talked about they don't know what the having is they don't know what 21 million is and they don't know the difference between a uh, uh, bitcoin solana and ethereum no difference at all this is just uh, one's one's a different one well, I have to. I, I definitely have to. Before Matt gives you the question, I definitely have to commend you. the The entire premise of my argument was, you know, if, if we were, you know, trying to win the conversation, so to speak, hinged on you not bringing up people being irrational, and so you, you've cleared that out. And so I think that the main difference is, I would say that the predictability of the cycles comes from external things. Uh, so, like, I, to me, interest rates and global liquidity cycles is really what drives it. Which is all to say, like it's it's uh, it's different ways of looking at the diamond that is is Bitcoin. So you you, you unfortunately have slayed my argument with in in the first thing. I, I was hoping that it would go a little longer so that I could do the the you know the the reveal and go. Well, all of this is premised on a very very tenuous assumption, which is everyone's going to act rationally when it comes to their money. Which, as you as you unfortunately so well articulated, is not always the case. So so Matt, not to not to steal thunder. What's what, what's the the lead on question? Yeah, no, I so okay. So it sounds like to me, obviously, we've got a lot of commonalities here. Um, and uh, it seems like uh, the debate seems to might might have been over, but hey, let's do this. Uh, with all of this conversation here between the doomers, those who are saying things are different, super cycle, you know, we've heard these different kind of narratives before, right? Like we've heard, we've heard it all. It's going to zero, it's going to 10 billion or whatever, right? Um, I, I, I you know, it seems to me is is my question to both of you is what it does Bitcoin become? Does it adhere to the macro landscape because it 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 essentially has to operate in that environment, or was Bitcoin designed for it specifically, or is it both? Mm. Oh wow! Well, I, I just did the first question. The macro events cl clearly have effects on Bitcoin. Le I mean, the, the, one of the things that you could, the, the people who doubt we're going to get, you know, a, a, an all time high type of thing again, uh, something that's possibly baked into the cake is Trump becoming president again. Well, it's not baked into the cake. When that happens, if that happens, it looks like it's going to happen. That is going to be very good for Bitcoin. It's but some people, are, it's going to be very good for the U.S. economy too, because a lot of the, the people in the know are, are going to understand. There's going to be a lot less regulation, a lot less things. So every everything's going to spike. So people are going to say, "Look, all the tech stocks spike. So Bitcoin spiking. So what is the what? There's something outside of Bitcoin that is definitely going to affect Bitcoin." If Trump becomes president, whether it be the trend of everybody getting back into tech stocks or that just that Trump became president. I mean, that that's you know, you can quibble uh, uh, over those things. But there's I mean, there, there, there are things on the horizon that are positive that are going to be good for Bitcoin, but aren't in Bitcoin. When the Ethereum ETF actually starts when they're allowed to actually start buying Ethereum, that is going to be good for Bitcoin. 
It's just it, it's just going to be a very positive thing because all these normies are going to start owning Ethereum and then they're going to start, you know, like, well, maybe I got diversified for the sake of diversification. I never got it on the Bitcoin one and it's cheap now. And, and blah, blah. so there's there's so many outside factors um, that that do affect the Bitcoin price. There, there, there are many things out there. So I, I do. It's not all like. It's not only that there's tw only 21 million and every hardly one, anyone even understands that, or that 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 it's just the having that's doing it. But it all every it it all goes hand in hand. Eventually, it all has it has an effect. But you just uh, what I just want to put out there again is just have a long term vision with this type of thing. Okay, just like don't get don't get stuck into you have the four year cycle in your head that just like this is a four year investment and then it all the little things that happen whether they be caused by macro uh large scale things whether there be an unplanned pandemic or whatever you know unforeseen so called pandemic or, or whether there be something within our space you know another part because there is going to be something within our space eventually where somebody robs someone big time there's going to one of these ETFs might uh, get hacked i mean that that is that will be within our space but these are just things that we have had before, just on smaller scales, and people have to get 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 used to it. So it's it, yeah, I mean that, that's a complex uh, question. I mean, complex answer, uh, a rambling answer to to, to your question. Yes, uh, yeah, macro and and the the Bitcoin within what's built into Bitcoin, it it, 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 it all affects the price. Yeah. RJ, got any thoughts well, on that? Yeah, so I would say I would say. Um... Yes, in principle, but now we're talking path dependency, which for, for people who are new to that, that means like how you started affects how you end up. I would say that, yes, it is impacted because it's interconnected with everything, but I, I'm, I'm not going to assume that when Satoshi published the Bitcoin white paper or published the, you know, the, the Bitcoin core software that they, that he, she, they knew that this was going to be the final instantiation. And so as far as we know, this could have just been a test that just kept working. And so I would I would say that, I mean, the, the Genesis block has it in there recorded, a macro event, right? The, the times, so for people who are not familiar, Genesis block is the first block when it published. Uh, Satoshi wrote into the block some, some uh, metadata that basically, not basically, it does repeat a a headline from, from England that says that the Times reports that the banks are on the the, the brink of insolvency, they're going to do another bailout, and so we we know that this. I'm of the opinion that Bitcoin existed before 2008 2009. That it, we were waiting for a moment, and when the big when the bank bailouts were announced, they said, "Aha, here's a great moment." That the time for Bitcoin has come. It, it's as it's as polished and as ready to publish as I'm ever going to get it. I might as well put it out into the ecosystem with this as being its its birthright. And so, so yes, macro events, macro events are necessarily interconnected. I don't think that in the early days when Satoshi and Hal and and all of the other original uh, kind of the the very the, the genesis, the the apostles of Bitcoin, as it were, were all you know back and forth on the message boards. Did they know that it was going to be what it was? I, I don't know that they could have ever envisioned this in in principle or, or in practice. They could have seen it in principle, but they they couldn't have known that. Oh wait, well Bitcoin version 2.0 is going to be the one we actually do. That's when we're going to launch. And so I would agree. I agree with with Adam is that it's all interrelated. It's all correlated because it is it has grown so big now, uh, but but maybe not in its very you know the very infancy in the cradle that was you know Bitcoin's origination. They would have known it would have been as connected as it is today in this version. Okay. I, I I agree with that. I, I I definitely agree that they weren't. Wor I mean, they were worried about solving macro problems and everything like that, but they didn't know the specifics of like you know how how, how big some of the outside effects would have on this mm -hmm. uh, this thing that they were creating. I mean, they were just they were concerned about the technical aspects that I mean, so that all the insiders here are so obsessed with. You know, twenty one million, and it's just you know it's all it, it, it comes out every so you know every ten minutes. You know, blocks, block this, size. Uh, yeah, 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 block yeah. frequency yeah they and so i i agree i think that's i think that's a, a a great re uh kind of reiteration okay well i'm gonna i'm gonna throw something in the mix you guys can pick it up and play with it if you want uh michael saylor obviously super smart guy does a great job explaining bitcoin big 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 hodler holder of bitcoin um and uh he's been on record in the past years making statements around the lines that uh all of our traditional financial models will eventually be destroyed by 
Bitcoin. Uh, basically, if Godzilla, I think his thing is like basically if Godzilla shows up to the picnic or something, it's all over. Um, but essentially, there was an interview I was watching a couple years ago or from a couple years ago, and he was saying, you know, if 10 billionaires were to purchase one billion dollars worth of Bitcoin and announce it to the world and say that they will and state that they will continue to buy that the financial models would be completely destroyed due to Bitcoin's potential value surge. Now, I would argue that uh, we may have seen something like this already in the sense that, you know, we've got BlackRock that currently holds 370,000 or over 307,000 Bitcoin. Uh, Wall Street keeps piling in. Billionaires are buying and buying. Billionaires are jumping on the bandwagon. Uh, nation states are starting to jump on the bandwagon. Uh what do you guys think? What do you what do you think Sailor means when he says eventually all of our models will be broken by Bitcoin? And is that a, is it even is that a, is that a true statement? No, it's I don't think it's a. Uh, he's he's a very smart man, so he thinks everybody else is smart. No, most people want fiat. They mo they want simple things. They don't they don't want to think this hard. If everybody was a genius, yeah, everyone would say this is this is clearly the best. This is the way the financial world should be run now. This is the way we're going to do it. We only know. I mean, <laughs> people do, People are stupid. People are irrational. People are going to want all cra all sorts of crazy scams and, and all, all, all sorts of things. So it, it, it sounds and, and it just makes people worship him more because it sounds like he's so, so, you know, into it, so gung ho. But he actually doesn't even. I mean, in the end of the day, he's, you know, he, he, he had to admit that, you know, what the, the, the Ethereum ETF happened and, and stuff <laughs> I, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> that type of thing. I mean, it, it's just like, I, I think there, there's some people that are just so smart. They don't get that the, the, the masses, that the regular people, they'll never be rational. They're going to have fun staying poor. And they really are going to have fun staying poor. They love gambling. They love this stuff. And, you know, you, you say nation states are adopting it. The evil nation states that want to control their people will never adopt it. They they love the power of 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 keep of, of printing it and, and stuff and forcing their subjugating their people to 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 to, to whatever they feel like doing to them. So um, is it? I think it's it's definitely innovate. You know, he, he could have said this is it has innovated money in such an incredible way. It is just it has taken the world to a whole new level of prosperity for those who opt into it. I mean, I think that that's good. That would have got him a lot of fans, but the, the, just to, the other statement is a little, it, it's hy hyperbolic. It, 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 it really is. Because Bitcoin has done a lot of great things. It has, re it, it is, it's really changed the way people think about it. it is the best money out there. And not only that, you know, it's, it's got, got this blockchain thing out there that people have done all, all sorts of other things to uh, with and modified, which aren't Bitcoin. And thus people are going to keep on doing those things also. And because they're irrational in error, you know, or, or, you know, it's, uh, there's no intrinsic uh, value in, in anything really. I, I think, I mean, it's just, everything's subjective. So some people that are, you know, complete morons are going to find uh, value in things that are, you're like, this is just t terrible, but it's great to them and it isn't Bitcoin. So, uh, and so Bitcoin didn't erase it. And so there's always going to be other stuff. out there. Yeah. RJ? So, so, so I will, I will, um, first say kind of as a, as a preparatory clause, I agree with Adam. And so now I'm just going to try to find a way to keep this interesting. So I'm, I'm going to steal me in the position that. Michael Saylor is correct, even though I agree that it's hyperbole, even though I agree that right supply and demand predated uh, Michael Saylor's description of, of kind of what we're on. And so I, I will say this, that there, there is, there is a potential, um, uh, a potential event horizon in economic thinking that is, that would make Michael Saylor correct. And that event horizon is the truly inelastic supply of money which effectively, if you're talking about the growth rate of money, the growth rate of Bitcoin in terms of, you know, once once we're done with the happenings and all the issuances, there's 21 million, 21 million forever, 21 million, unless, you know, some cataclysm happens, that a, tr that a zero growth in money supply in some models of economics is effectively like dividing by zero. It's an undefined mathematical operation. And in some senses, because the money supply never grows, because the money supply is inelastic, it does take things to either affinity, which is very difficult to comprehend, or it's like dividing by zero, which it's it's an undefined, it's just a mathematical operation that breaks our understanding of numbers. 
And so I will say only in the in that con in those two contexts where the growth of money is necessary for your way of defining economics or finance or whatever, which is the modern monetary theorist, right? They're all about growing money supply and shrinking it and how the government gets to influence what's happening, whether it be inflation or employment or whatever it is. They do that by turning the dial on the, the flow of money and the, the flow of money out of an economy. To them, the modern monetary theory system does break with Bitcoin because there is no growth. There is no way to public. It doesn't matter if Bitcoin is worth $10 or $10 billion. No one can, so to speak, go out to the harder to reach Bitcoins and dig deeper into the ground to find that extra expensive Bitcoin to find. It doesn't work that way. It's it's based on it's based on the Bitcoin core software and it says the difficulty is this. This is how we adjust it. It will always be, you know, the, the block reward will always be this until it's done. We cannot change that. So I will say in that very limited context, where because Bitcoin is truly an inelastic uh, commodity, that, that that will break some things. But then again, it's 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 talking about, it's the difference between first principles thinking, which is like supply and demand, things that Adam has articulated, and some of the more tortured economic theories where you go, well, if we're willing to assume a relative value of everything, then it's all about growth and changes. And in that sense, yes, all of that, the modern monetary theorists, all of those things, all of that has to die away. And so I, I would say that Michael Saylor could be right in that sense if we get to the point where everyone wakes up and goes, truly an elastic money, we can't control it. It it breaks all of our things. So I, I would say that. I, I think that's great the way you explain it there. In the theoretical complex high IQ world, he is correct. But dudes, I'm living in reality here, baby. I'm not dealing with, I know the masses, they do what they do and they don't care about theory. They don't, you know, but in, in his theoretical smart man world, yes, you gave a, a beautiful scenario of why he's correct in that world that does not really exist. That is, it is awesome that he, yeah, he's correct. Great. That's awesome. That, but I, we don't live in that world. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. So, okay. So in, in a loose summary here, I'm, I'm going to try to put this in a little box in a bow. Um, you know, we, we have irrational people that are going to still do irrational things and assert value to things that probably won't help them in the long run. Um, and they may do that all the way to their, um, to their deathbed. Um, but it's like, is, do the models break because, it's not necessarily that Bitcoin breaks it, or is it because that the nature of fiat systems always fail and that the globe is for the first time in history on an entirely fiat standard, therefore this whole crash and burn thing has to happen? I mean, is it um, – will, will, the, will the irrational people be forced – to make better decisions because of the innate nature of fiat systems? I don't have to worry about that. Michael Saylor has to explain that because I don't think it's going to happen. It's not going to, it's not, it's only breaking in theory. It's only breaking everything in his theory. And it's, it's not going to happen is, is, is what, what I'm saying. So we don't, we don't have to worry about that. It is, is yeah, that I, I don't, that's my answer. Uh, yeah, so so I'll I'll expand a little bit, and, and I agree with I agree with Adam in that that rationality or irrationality are maybe not even equally balanced. Perhaps there is a, a skew to the irrational, um, but I I would say that from the from the centralized authority perspective, that the the Jerome Powells of the world, the chancellors of the EU world, they are all living in the the Michael Saylor rational world. They are operating under modern modern monetary theory. They are at the quote unquote dials of the money printer, changing interest rates and money issuances, or buybacks, or treasuries, or or disc and things like that. And so, from their perspective, which I would agree with, Adam has to be theoretically divorced from what's actually happening in the economy, because if it actually worked, then there would never be any problems, right? A centralized economies would work. We would all be living under communism because the smartest man in the <laughs> the smartest man in the tower would go, well, actually, the you know the interest rate needs to be one point two three six eight you know etc percent, and it, when it gets to this point, we're going to change it, and everybody would have you know the two car garage and two point four children, and you know you have your thirty some odd days off. 
And so I, I would say that I agree with Adam there. And I, I will I will make one kind of debate the moderator here. I would actually push back against the premise that we are operating in a totally fiat system because we see that when it breaks down in principle. You go to Argentina, you go into into our history, right? In Argentina, you're not trading in in pesos or bolivars. You're trading in other things. In fact, they may even go back to a barter. In the you know in the in the Cold War when the U.S. and the and Russia wanted to uh, make trade with each other, which they still did even though they had embargoes, they didn't trade in dollars or rubles. They traded in vodka and dollar and uh, excuse me vodka and oil. It's the same thing in Saudi Arabia. The, right, we, we will find ways, j- just in the yeah, same way that Bitcoin. But isn't a isn't an abandonment of those pieces of paper to barter a failure of the pieces of paper? I I, w- I would say that I would say that they'd never have succeeded. That's okay. that. So they, it's just that, um, short term, short term thinking. You know, the expediency of short term thinking says, well, if it's easier to make money through the fiat system, I'll do it that way. If it's easier to build wealth, wealth through a barter system, I'll do it that way. Bitcoin just happens to get to exist in a in an anti fragile state where every time somebody makes some adjustment that impacts everything, it just could, gets to do kind of the stepwise function upward, and it, it just continues to improve. Adam, you have I- something. Yeah, I want to say that, you know, you fiat, everyone says fiat always fails. In the long run, fiat always fails. Uh, but th- this is a, this is kind of a, a nuanced thing here. Let, let, let's analyze fiat. Yeah, in these third world countries, yeah, it always fails. What we mean by fails, they inflate it to nothing. That is fail. Okay, that is when it's over. It's nothing. It's worth, it's, it's, it's terrible. It's terrifying, these situations. Now, not every, not every country has ended up that way. Some, it's just like a never ending process of, have fun staying poor, but they, they're able to maintain it. And let me tell you, in these technologically sophisticated, most powerful countries in the history of mankind, United States, Japan, Western Europe, Australia, they haven't even tried the uh, the, the uh, central bank digital currency yet. We haven't even gotten to that point yet. So we're a long way for these the most powerful nations on earth for their uh their fiat con- currencies going to zero, we are a long way. I mean, it, I am so curious to see how the Western nations do these uh, central bank digital currencies and how they they make the masses so happy with their inflation. There's going to be negative interest rates. They're not going to be allowed to buy certain things, but they're going to love it because they're going to get a check every month from the government. I mean, for, for, uh, from these CBDCs from their directly from their Federal Reserves. I mean, it, it, it's going to be amazing to see the creativity these central planners get because of glorious technology created by the a private sector, Satoshi Nakamoto and everything. They're going to bastardize it and everything into this power lusting tool. But let me tell you something. If dollar isn't going to zero, euro isn't going to zero anytime soon. They're not that, you know, every part of you know, there's a certain corner of the Bitcoin uh, space that just think thinks it's right around the corner. They're praying. They're they they. I mean, that's part of their existence. That the dollar is going to. They hate America so much, and they hate the West so much. I guess I know they think that's a great thing. That that you know that the dollar will go to. It's not happening anytime soon. And yeah, all these third world currencies. Yeah, they're going to keep on doing what they're doing. I mean, that that that's that that might increase the pace of hype uh, because every these third world countries when you when you're all of a sudden able. To get this digital dollar for the United States, why are you gonna why are you gonna use your uh, Zambian currency anymore? Okay, or Congo currency anymore? Of course, you're gonna use uh, the, the, a CBDC of other country. It'll probably be easier to use than Bitcoin. Sadly, uh, on, on certain levels, they'll, they'll be convinced that. So, uh, you know, this pre- I, I wanted to add that to the discussion because I have a di- I, I guess it's a different take than a lot of Bitcoiners have. I don't I. I, I don't worry about the uh, you know uh, the uh, uh, hyperinflation in in all these countries uh, in, in modern I, I'm not holding my breath in, in especially in the modern countries because there's there's so much creativity yeah I mean technology always saves the butts of these uh, central planners in the most powerful countries that's what I, I see that's happening um, but it's not not if you're a whole Bitcoin you can, you can just have popcorn and watch the whole darn thing happen whatever way it goes down that's what I do. Well, you know, talking about saving butts, I mean, look at uh, stablecoin issuers, you know, uh, whether it be Tether or USDC. I mean, the oh, yes. the the whole bond, the whole government bond market, like, has new buyers. I mean, right? Matt, that is such a great point. The, the people in office should be loving Tether. 
They're the one who's buying all the uh, all, all the U.S. debt now. I mean, a, a, a huge amount of it, more than uh, so, so many other countries out there. Tether could be its own country. Let them keep doing that. That's propping up the freaking United States dollar, but what, what, what Tether is doing. Which, but they want to regulate it. They want to say no. They want to put Tether. You know, Elizabeth Warren makes no sense. She, she she wants to destroy things like that. No, no, no. They, they're the ones that are that are giving the dollar. It's or helping. Them. Let Tether keep on buying as much U.S. debt as as, as they want. Bonds, whatever the heck they darn. They darn by. Let them keep on doing it uh, because they they promote the dollar and the and the United States will remain a very powerful country thanks to tether. I mean that that's that's really weird, but it's true. Well, and why do you why would you need a uh, a, a spooky central bank digital currency when you know the government like the CIA or whatever is implemented in with uh, or in bed with tether or um, some other stablecoin project? I mean, you you have like you have this ability to sell the idea of I don't know. I, I I just feel like I don't think the central bank digital currency stuff will will win in in the current state current narrative. Well, I, I think it's a it's a let's see how it develops. Uh, see how in bed uh, the the United States government is with some of these other cent with these other some of these other stable coins because you, you've got a point. If they're if the United States government really uh, I don't know the names of the other ones that are highly regulated and stuff by the United States already because I just don't care about stable. I, 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 I'm very interested in Tether, but then I start, you know, they list all these others of coin market cap. I, I can't tell the difference from, you know, USD coin or whatever. That one's uh, uh, that one's highly regulated. Yeah. And so maybe that's the route they will go. The United States, instead of creating their own central bank digital currency, they'll just, you know, uh, regulate that one in the way that they want to, and that'll become the, the official, pro you know, just like the Federal Reserve isn't exactly public. It yep, isn't exactly Exactly. Private. That'll that be what, what, what that is. But I do think in some of these other nations, um, that you know, maybe like Australia or Japan, I mean, Japan, Japan will probably have their own central bank uh, digital currency. I, I think they, they will. And so it'll be very interesting to see how it, how it develops there, what they try. But their people don't want uh, checks from the government. So, I mean, Maybe some, maybe the European Union. They, they, let, let's see how they do their central bank digital currency. That that'll be very interesting. That'll be very interesting. Yeah, I'll, I'll say. I think I think they're they're. Uh, I don't know if it's contrarian or in line with it. I think that there will be central bank digital currencies, but I, I don't want. I want to strip off some of like the, the the like the moral implications of that. The U.S. dollar system right now is an analog electronic system. It's a difference between an analog electronic technology and a digital technology. The U.S. is going to switch just in the same way that China did, just in the same way that there are other countries doing it. The question is, to what degree will we, the United States, permit there to be control or censorship or things like that? Moving to a central bank digital currency as opposed to the U.S. electronic dollar is a net positive for the United States. It is more efficient. It is easier to manage and it's easier to maintain. This, this right, the the three and a half percent that you pay to Visa or Mastercard or whatever, the the arbitrage and the transaction costs to the U.S. government also goes down to CBDC. So in that sense, I think that they, I think that they will continue to pursue it and you will see some form of it just because it is the necessary upgrade to go from analog to digital technology. The question I think that we're kind of more debating is, is it going to have, uh, you know, are you going to have to maintain your accounts with the, with the Federal Reserve? Are you going to have self-custody of USDC or, you know, whatever the stable coin gets called? And are you allowed to control it or will the federal government in the same way that China has control over like WeChat and say, mm, we, you know, that message that you sent was not in line with your, uh, with your, uh, your, 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 your social credit score. We are going to deduct this or we're going to suspend your thing or you're not going to be allowed to shop at wherever. That's where I think we get into the control element. But, you know, that, that's, that's kind of, kind of saying what Adam's saying, just in a, I'm, I'm just willing to kind of get nuanced and kind of chop this thing up a little bit. Another control element that a country could do, and God forbid the United States ever tried to do something, but you know, a country like if Argentina goes to the other side again, which they very well could be, it's just like uh, uh, making uh, no more private banks. We're making banks illegal. You're just uh, the way you do it is you keep your money at the Federal Reserve. Look how convenient we make, and that is real control right there. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a main, you know that that's some of the evil you could do with CBDC. Is just saying, yeah, no, no, we're we're, we're uh, making all the banks. Uh, there, there are no more private banks uh, for for the people. We're gonna get rid of all these evil banksters, and you're gonna have your money with the Bank of Australia now. And that, that that's it. You know, it, God forbid something like that happens. But it, it, mm -hmm. this, this is something. You know, the, the power of a CBDC. You know, if you wanted to take it down that road.
Well, um, we've got about five or six minutes before we got to close out the show. So I want to take it here. I want to take the conversation to, we talked about uh, the cyclical nature, what may be causing it, theories behind it. Is that going to break? Uh, we started talking about central bank digital currencies, but I want to go, I want to go this way with it. Um, we're here now. We know where we're at. We're at the cusp of a awesome bull market. If, I mean, we're in it, but we're going to be in the, 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 the better parts of it here uh, shortly. What comes next uh, and what should we expect for both of you? Okay, Adam, I'll, I'll defer. I, I, okay, what comes next? 2025 is going to be awesome. It is going to be just like uh, 2021 you know, in, in terms of happiness. Now, but I don't, let's take it one second step at a time. Let's get to the six digit realm. I'm not one of those guys that are like, oh, it's going to be a million dollars. This time it's different. It's going to be a million or a billion or this or, you know, Max Kaiser saying that you're know, being wrong every single time, but, you know, saying insane things and how big it's going to be, but everybody forgets that he said it was wrong. Uh, no, it's it's just like, let's let's be happy. I mean, geez, getting to the sick to $100,000, it's amazing when I think back to 2013. It's freaking amazing. So uh, expect a, a great year in 2025. Let's get to that six digit realm first, but I'm not, I'm not going out of my way. I'm not going to say like a million dollars or something like that, um, or when that's even going to occur, because a hundred thousand is freaking awesome. Now, the other thing I want to say for all the Bitcoin, uh, uh, the, the, the people in the Bitcoin Inquisition, that there are things that are going to happen that you're not going to like, like Solana might get an ETF, okay, a venture capital funded coin might get an ETF, and you're, oh, that's not fair. But guess what? That'll be great for Bitcoin too, okay. It, it really is. You've got to really look at the positive aspect. You can't hate on some of these things so much that you're just like blind to the fact that, wait, this helps Bitcoin also. So I think uh, we're going to see a lot of altcoin craziness again in uh, in 2025 also, just because it always coincides with the Bitcoin bull market. All these other people, and they have every right to do it, can jump into all this other insane stuff. But I do, I do hope that um, every altcoin gets to have an etf okay because it's good for because <laughs> sadly all these normies out there the only way they're even going to ever get in the cryptocurrency and bitcoin is through their 70 year old uh, money manager who allows them to buy an etf it's disgraceful but that's just the way the world works i'm a realist okay not everyone's going to get a trezor and etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. so i see it as a good thing I, it doesn't hurt bitcoin at all when these other things get etfs it helps bitcoin the nor more and more normies hold it, so that's good. Okay, we're running low on time. RJ, thirty seconds. What's thirty next? seconds? Okay, so I would say I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with Adam in principle, but I'm gonna peel the 2025 label off of it and just say that uh, when the dollar loses relative value to other currencies, we will see a flow into Bitcoin. So if you look at the, it's called the DXY. It's an index of the U.S. dollar priced in other currencies. If you ma marry that up with Bitcoin price, 2013 to 2015. Uh, the dollar goes up by 18%. Bitcoin don't, goes down by 80. 2017, dollar goes down 11%. Bitcoin goes up 1,800%. You can track this all the way through. I will say that whenever we start a dollar weakening cycle, so the first time that the central, the the Federal Reserve announce a rate announces a rate cut, basically saying we're going to make the dollar less valuable, that 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 new liquidity, that new money will be looking for a place to go. Good money chases out bad money. It will direct itself towards towards uh, Bitcoin. Now, could they could they string this out through all of 2025 and not till 2026? Possibly. Could we break something in the economy in August and we say we have to drop to zero in September? It could happen in 2024. Uh, I think that's if you're talking about timing, that's when what Adam has described as kind of when this cycle kicks off. It's it's the weakening of the dollar and value as a concept, looking for somewhere else to go. That that's when this the new kind of cycle kind of builds itself, which is again just a fractal or another way of saying what Adam is saying, which is essentially just buy it, hold it. It's going to get better over time. If you will wait four years, it's always going to be worth more into the future. So so don't worry yourself too much with the particulars of the game. Dollar cost average. If you like to do that, invest however you can. Bitcoin is a great is a great store of value. It's a great money. It's 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 where it's going to all go anyway. We're just debating on we're rearranging deck chairs. That's all this is. All right. Well, hey, 2025 Solana ETF, Dog with Hat ETF. You heard it here first. Uh, Adam, where can people find you? Yeah, just uh, on Twitter. I'm Techbalt T E C H B A L T on YouTube. Look up Bitcoin Meister. 
or Adam Meister. You know, there's plenty out there. Disruptmeister.com. You'll, you'll get to me. You'll find me. But I'm on Twitter every single day. I tweet every single day. T-E-C-H-B-A-L-T. That's like Technology Baltimore. All right, guys. Well, that wraps up today's show. It's been a great conversation with Adam Meister, the Bitcoin Meister, and our co-host, Rick Jackson, also known as RJ. We'll see you guys same time, same place, my friends. Remember, Bitcoin is not changing the future. It's changing the world right now. We'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Boom. That was the show.